Welcome everyone to this live and also recorded webinar for InnerSource Health. We're going to take just a few more minutes to have a few more attendees um, have a moment to sign on and join. Make sure there's no technical difficulties. If you have any questions, um, feel free to ask a question. You should see a Q&A link um, or a chat box. Feel free to ask questions. We'll save those all to the end. But if you're having any technical issues right now, um, feel free to let us know. Okay, hi everybody. So happy to be here. And I think I am Dr. Peter Bongiorno. I'm a naturopathic doctor and acupuncturist here with Dr. Robert Kochko, who you whose voice you already heard. And welcome to the inaugural webinar for Inner Source Health. We plan on doing a lot of these. We plan on making this a place where new uh, interesting and on the cutting edge information gets brought to you as quickly as possible so you can learn what's going on in an easy way and in a fun fashion for um, all the new information about medical health that's happening and changing so fast. So I think we've given what a couple hundred talks between the two of us this is the first one that's being recorded. So we're getting with the times. <laughs> Inner source is now fully yeah. with the times. So we're very, very thrilled you're here. Thank you for being here. So tonight we're going to talk about heart health. Uh, the title is Better Than a Statin. So what do we mean when we ask that question, better than a statin? Um, basically, uh, what's been happening in heart disease is, um, well, one way to think about it, uh, and I'm going to just advance the slide. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, we're working on uh, slide advancement. OK, there we go. All right, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Rob, uh, who you'll be hearing in a few minutes. Rob is a healthy and aging specialist focusing on cardiovascular disease and brain health. He's actually president-elect of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. 
which means that he is the top naturopathic physician in the country and, uh, and leads the rest of us naturopathic physicians. So we're very thankful to all the work he does on the state le level and also on the national level to advance naturopathic medicine and natural health care and getting states licensed. So thank you so much, Rob, for that. He's a past board of director for the New York Association of Naturopathic Physicians. He's a medical advisor for a number of profit and nonprofit medical organizations. And he's also uh, currently working on a book. We're actually working on a book together um, for memory and Alzheimer's prevention and treatment. Uh, my background, uh, I do have a background in research. I went to a naturopathic school at Bastyr University in Seattle. I've authored a couple of books. Uh, on the, in the mental health field, I, I was president of the New York Association of Naturopathic Physicians. And uh, in 2018, actually, I went surfing for the first time, and I think I broke my toe. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go back and try it again because it was a lot of fun. Uh, and this is our team at Inner Source. That's Lindsay on the left, myself, uh, Pina Logidice is a naturopathic doctor and acupuncturist, and my wife, uh, Victoria Liotta, who's a doctor of acupuncture. Uh, Don Siglan, who's also a naturopathic doctor and a licensed acupuncturist, and of course, Rob. Okay, so we're going to talk about heart health. So heart, um, heart medicine is quite important. The reason is, is because it's typically considered the number one killer in this country. Now, I know if you look at different statistics and different uh, research papers, heart disease and cancer vie for the number one position uh, depending on the year, but most years it is heart disease is considered number one. So, you know, if you're breathing, um, you have to be concerned about heart disease. You have to be concerned about preventing it, and you have to be equipped and have knowledge on how to treat it uh, if it comes up for you. And, and really what we're going to talk about tonight is understanding a lot of the background of heart disease to do both, to help prevent it and to help treat it when it comes up. So, when we talk about heart disease, what are we really worried about? We're worried about plaque formation. We're worried about this gunk that, um, that basically accumulates in the hoses or in the piping of your cardiovascular system. And, and the piping is designed to carry blood from the heart to all of your organs and to all of your tissues and to keep you healthy. And I apologize for the sirens in the background. The office is here on 7th Avenue. So we're going to hear some sirens uh, from the New York City Police Department. We're going to talk about stress and the impact of stress <laughs> on the heart. So. Right. And those sirens can make you a little stressed out. So, um, so anyway, so plaque is really the issue. That's what we're concerned about because plaque blocks up the arteries, especially the arteries around the heart. And when they get blocked up, heart disease can happen uh, because now the heart itself can't get the blood supply it needs and it loses oxygen and then the heart muscle can, can die. So when we go to the doctor and we think about heart disease um, and the doctor talks to us about heart disease, usually what they talk about is cholesterol. Cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol. Well, let's check your cholesterol. Is your cholesterol high? Is your bad cholesterol high? Is your cholesterol too high? Should we get that down a bit? Um, that seems to be what's going on. Um, when, you, when you think about what, what cholesterol is, it's really um, sort of a reaction molecule. When, when, and, and what it's used for is basically as a plaster. So, so the pipes that are considered your blood vessels are really this living tissue, right? It's all these muscle cells that, um, that create this piping. And, and those muscle cells can shear and they can break and they can create little tears in them. Um, when, the, when those little tears happen, then stuff can collect in them. And that's what plaque is. So what pokes those holes and creates those little tears? Um, high blood pressure, cigarettes, too much sugar in your diet, like when people have diabetes, a poor diet, stress, uh, a few other things that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, what grows that plaque formation and increases that gunk? Sorry, we're going to go back one. I forgot about that slide. How do you go back? Okay. So what grows that gunk? Inflammation. And we're going to talk about the causes of inflammation. And what plugs up um, and makes more gunk? Uh, too much cholesterol. So cholesterol is a factor. And also calcium can be uh, part of what plugs it up. 
So cholesterol certainly is a player, but the question is, how much of a player is cholesterol really? So interestingly, before we get to answer that question, um, there have been studies done. This one was from 2008. So this is 11 years old, this study. And what it showed in looking at a number of people, uh, especially among people with type 2 diabetes, what they looked at these people with diabetes and they were trying to figure out what are the LDLs, what are the bad cholesterol numbers for people who get cancer? And what they found is that when people had very low cholesterol, under 87 for the LDL, bad cholesterol, they had a 50% increased risk of cancer. 50% increased risk, that's pretty significant. If they had an LDL of less than 107, they had a 33% increased risk of cancer. But if they had LDL rates between 108 and 145, with an ideal around 126, they had no significant cancer risk. So what this is telling us is that conceivably, as we lower cholesterol numbers, especially the LDL bad cholesterol, that seemingly cancer rates go up. So that's pretty interesting because up until now, and I think what most doctors would say is that, well, you know, cholesterol, there's really nothing good about cholesterol, right? Um, I do a lot of work with mental health and there's also similar numbers in regards to how cholesterol may affect the brain, may affect um, dementia and memory, and also may affect depression, meaning that when we have very low rates of cholesterol, those conditions can actually increase too. So there seems to be a reason for cholesterol overall, and it's a question of balance, not just lowering it and lowering it and lowering it. And every time we come out with a new cholesterol drug, drug it seems like all it does is lower it even more. And so what's the risk of that? So, and I want you to remember another thing when we think about cholesterol and its role. Half the people with normal cholesterol have significant plaque buildup. Okay, so this has been shown. So basically people, half the people who get heart attacks have normal to low cholesterol. And a lot of people with high cholesterol don't really have much plaque buildup and don't get heart disease. So total cholesterol becomes less of a risk factor for all cause cardiovascular mortality the older people get. So that's important to remember as well. So, so these studies, which came out last year, this is October of 2018, and then another study from June of 2018, show there's very little connection between bad cholesterol and heart disease, according to researchers, and dietary cholesterol and the lack of evidence in cardiovascular disease. So these are two studies um, the most interesting study was actually this um, review of LDL, quote, bad cholesterol does not cause cardiovascular disease. And they did a comprehensive re literature review. And the points that these, they showed, and these are actually um, practitioners and researchers from different countries, from Sweden, from Japan, from the United States. So I like this study because it was very global in its mindset and looking at these vast numbers of people. And what they showed is the, um, these are some summary points. There are a few more, but I tried to uh, cut it to just a few. And what they said was the idea that high cholesterol levels in the blood are the main cause of cardiovascular disease, CVD, is impossible because people with low levels become just as atherosclerotic as people with the high levels and their risk of suffering from cardiovascular disease is the same or higher. So maybe after this webinar, you might wanna go back to this slide and reread that. But what it's saying is that the idea that high cholesterol causes cardiovascular disease is pretty much impossible based on looking at the research. And that the benefits of good cholesterol, I mean bad cholesterol, LDLC, in overall lifespan has virtually been ignored by researchers. And we could talk about maybe later about the reasons why. <laughs> so maybe one is that Cholesterol medications are the greatest selling medications of all time. So, but we could talk about that later. Let's stick to health today. And the third point is that statin treatment has been considered beneficial by experts who have really ignored a lot of negative outcome studies. And, and down at the bottom there, is, it shows you the journal that this is um, published in. So all, all from 2018. So, one of the things we're going to talk about today that uh, Dr. Rukachko is really going to focus on is testing that can really help us understand what our risk is, what our risk really is, and how important cholesterol may 
or may not be in this risk. So um, if, if there's a slide that I could recommend you try to remember um, after this webinar is over, uh, among all the great information that Dr. Kochka is going to talk about, um, I think this is a good this is a good slide because this slide really encapsulates all the factors we really have to think about. Um, when we think about what really causes plaque, and we know now that it's not just cholesterol, what we know is that smoking is certainly a huge factor, poor sleep, stress, lack of exercise, blood pressure issues, too much weight, blood sugar issues, inflammation, um, oral disease, meaning when there's a lot of inflammation in the mouth, poor diet, toxicities, uh, meaning pollutants and heavy metals and plastics and things like that, as well as medications, which are, are definitely a toxin. And then certainly genetics can predispose and play a role as well. Um, not as great as we thought. Now that we're getting all this information, we're finding genetics are less and less an issue. And actually that all the things above it that we just mentioned will actually control whether certain genes for heart disease get turned on and don't get turned on, which is another lecture in and of itself. So I did want to just emphasize how smoking is such a critical piece. And I know many of you who are listening to this probably aren't smokers. You're already into natural health and hopefully you're not smoking. But uh, for any friends and family, um, this is a good study to remember. In the six months, there was a, there was a ban on smoking hospital emissions for heart attacks fell by 40% in the city of Helena, Montana. Uh, and that's from the British Medical Journal in 2004. So it's clear that smoking doesn't play a minor role in lowering heart attack rates, but it plays an absolutely major role. Um, Shakespeare knew in the 1700s how important stress was to the heart. And his quotes are from the Winter's Tale, merry heart goes all the day, your sad heart tires in a mile. So he knows when you're sad and when you're stressed, your heart isn't gonna work well. And in King Lear, uh, the quote is, ingratitude are marble hearted fiends. So what it's saying is that when you, when you don't have gratitude, your heart marbleizes. And really when you think about what plaque is, what's plaque? Plaque is all this fat and accumulation around and in the vessels of your heart. And it kind of marbleizes it. So Shakespeare knew that way back then, that, in, that not having gratitude can marbleize your heart. And he also said in Love, Labor's Lost, which is a little more comic uh, for, for his plays, a light heart lives a long time. So just nice things to remember. Um, and Dr. Mehmet Oz, uh, when asked what, what kills people in terms of heart disease, uh, he's quoted as saying what you had for breakfast and who you fought with tonight will determine whether you have a heart attack tomorrow. And he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. So again, how to prevent heart disease. Um, we talked about these. And now I'm going to give it over to Dr. Kochko. Um, and he will be with you for the rest of the evening. So it was really a pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Dr. Kochko, for being here. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bongiorno. So I think it's worth reiterating just for a moment why we called this lecture better than a statin. So, you know, it's not that we're against statins. Every medication has a time and a place. You know, the way I describe naturopathic integrated functional medicine is that it's not so much whether there's one approach to medicine that's right or one approach to medicine that's wrong. It's really much more about the right approach for the right person at the right time. And so our perspective here is that um, statins, as you saw on that earlier slide that listed all the mechanisms and all the factors that contribute to heart disease, statins are maybe one tiny piece of that puzzle. Um, much more important is some combination of lifestyle and genetics. It, research is still elucidating exactly what that combination is. However, what we understand is that you are fully in control and you have an ability to reduce your risk of heart disease. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We really want to understand, well, before I understand that I have to take these sometimes rather drastic measures to reduce my risk, how do I even know if I have a problem? Um, and I think that's really important. Dr. Bongiorno mentioned earlier this point of um, cancer and heart disease sort of changing places every once in a while in our epidemiology, and, and we're never clear on which one's more important um, or which one's a, a higher likely killer in our country. I, I lecture to medical students um, fairly often. And, and one of the pieces of trivia that I actually start with for my heart disease lectures, um, is I asked the group, 
who, you know, third and fourth year medical students who've read all the epidemiology t textbooks and understand the pathophysiology, understands what happens with heart disease. I asked them what the most common first presenting symptom is of heart disease. And very often trained in, in understanding how heart disease manifests, people will say chest pain or angina. Um, they'll maybe say shortness of breath or weakness or fatigue. Um, all those are true and they all exist on the list of symptoms that a person will present with. But the most common presenting symptom is actually sudden cardiac death. That's why this is so important. You know, we, we worry so much about cancer because it comes out of nowhere and it sort of brings you to your knees. Heart disease can do very much the same. And so um, being proactive about understanding what our risks are and then the steps that we can take to reduce those risks um, to our mind is, is really important. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time here talking mostly about blood tests and a little bit of time at the end talking about some therapeutics. We're talking mostly about the different testing because, first of all, we want to bring you the latest and greatest, and we want to empower you and equip you to be able to go to your doctors and um, have these conversations or, you know, you're welcome to come and work with us as well. Um, but what's, what's most important is that you feel like you're in control you feel like you have the knowledge and the tools to take care of yourself because in the end, um, you are your best advocate. Um, and in the end, we will talk about a couple of nutrients and some dietary stuff that might be useful. Um, I, but I want to bring up again, mentioning that idea of the sudden cardiac death and uh, Shakespeare's and Dr. Bongiorno's idea of gratitude being so important. One of my favorite studies um, as it relates to heart health, um, it's a study that came out a couple of years ago where they actually followed nurses um, retroactively by actually reading their journal entries from when they entered the seminary, when they entered, entered their schooling, and they quantified the types and the amount of positive expressions and the amount of gratitude they expressed throughout their journal entries in their 20s and 30s. And they followed these women uh, for a couple of years in their 80s to see um, how likely it was that they were to have heart disease and actually pass away from heart disease. And the risk of sudden cardiac death went up three or four times um, when you compared the people who um, had less instances of, of expressions of gratitude within their journal entries than those who didn't. And I, I always thought that was quite salient because while it's really important to make sure diet is aligned with your evolutionary needs. And it's really important to make sure you're getting the right nutrients. You're not deficient in any vitamins or minerals. Um, it's also really important that we um, have an appropriate expression of love and community. It's important that we have the right types of stress reducing techniques um, that we can turn to when, when things get difficult for us. And so I, I really want to highlight that because even though we are going to be talking about all these blood tests, which at times can be a little bit dry, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not much more that's important. Um, and, and I know with all of our patients, um, Dr. Bongiorno and I, we always are working on helping people navigate their lives from the perspective of ha handling stress and building resilience and all those wonderful things as well. So I also wanna point out that what we'll do after this talk um, is send out, um, send out these exact slides. So I don't need you guys taking notes. I want you to just sit back, relax and listen um, the slides will be a little bit text heavy at times, and that's ma mainly for that purpose so that you can feel comfortable knowing that the information I'm providing you um, will be available to you so you don't have to worry about writing it all down. Um, and so I, I think one of the most surprising aspects of this whole journey for people is understanding that medicine is evolving so quickly that what once was a comprehensive assessment of heart disease risk, which as Dr. Bongiorno mentioned, always uh, centers around cholesterol and lipid panels and things like triglycerides um, is no longer sufficient. To my mind, um, and really to the mind of the leading researchers in lipidology and, and heart disease, um, it, it's become quite clear that the tools that we've been using before, tools, as you can see on this screen, like total cholesterol, quote unquote, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, we'll talk about both. Um, those tools are no longer sufficient to understand if that person sitting in your office is actually at risk or not. And so that's what we normally see as, you know, as naturopathic doctors, we've been keeping an eye on this literature for a long time. Um, and, and for a long time, we've been sort of sending people back to their cardiologist and equipping them with some of the tools that you'll be learning today uh, to understand what it is um, that they need to be asking for to make sure that they really are assessing risk. 
And what we're finding is medicine is slow to change. And, and very often you'll go to your doc and they'll say, nope, that's fine. Um, you know, I, I respectfully disagree. And that's why we're doing this talk so that we can make sure that you're aware of some of those, the latest research as well. But the fact is, if someone comes into me um, with this type of cholesterol panel, and one thing that's really missing here is the LDL cholesterol. You see on the bottom there, HDL cholesterol. Um, L LDL cholesterol is, is historically one of our uh, more important indicators. But even if I knew that this person's LDL cholesterol was 80 or 90 or 120 or 150 or 170, I still couldn't fully tell them whether they were at risk. And the main reason for that is what these are measuring is the total amount of cholesterol. And what we're going to talk about here is um, in addition to all the other factors like inflammation, like blood sugar, like the tendency we have to clot in certain ways, it's also really important to understand that all cholesterol particles are not created equal. HDL, quote unquote, good cholesterol, LDL, quote unquote, bad cholesterol. What we actually need to look at is the individual types of particles and whether we have the types of particles that are protective. So whether we have um, just put very simply, big fluffy particles that tend to be protective for the heart and for our vasculature, or small dense particles that are more likely to oxidize. Um, oxidation is like rust basically happening in our arteries, um, more likely to cause the types of damage. Dr. Bongiorno mentioned earlier this idea of poking holes um, and cholesterol being there to clean it up. Um, so so the, the story gets much more complex than good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And that's we're going to be spending a lot of time um, on in the next, I'd say, 20, 20 to 25 minutes. So we also call this, this conversation better than a statin because statins are the most commonly prescribed medication. The challenge is for most people who are put on statins, we don't actually know if their issue is, in, is one that a statin will fix. So again, statins have a place. What they do is change our body's ability to make uh, cholesterol. They, literally, they turn off a step, something called HMG-CoA reductase. You don't have to remember that. But it, 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 um, it blocks our ability to make cholesterol. And so, um, of course, our bodies, our livers produce cholesterol and produce um, some of these proteins that, that move it around our bodies. But just the same, we also absorb it from food. And so there are some people, especially some people with certain genetic predispositions, um, especially people whose families, uh, who have families where high cholesterol runs throughout their family, um, they will typically um, overabsorb cholesterol. And so um, unless we're measuring and, and looking on an individual basis and really personalizing our care to understand, is this person who we're considering a statin for, um, is their issue one of production for which a statin would make sense? Or is it one of absorption for which a whole different class of medications would make sense? So if you're looking at the screen, um, these two markers of production, lathosterol and desmosterol, um, if those are low, it's probably not an issue of production and a statin probably won't be appropriate. Uh, later in, in the slides, we're gonna be talking about some genetic um, considerations there as well. Now, if their beta cytosterol and camposterol are high, um, well, maybe their issue is an absorption issue. And again, it's a totally different treatment. Um, and I should clarify, you see on, this, um, on these slides, Boston Heart. Um, we use a lot of Boston Heart lab testing in our clinic. Um, the typical Quest and LabCorp um, also have their own testing. Quest has something called Cardio IQ that your providers may be able to order. Uh, LabCorp has something called the NMR Lipo Profile. And different labs have different versions of these tests. Um, we really like and trust Boston Heart, um, and we're using uh, we're using some of the we're using their name with their permission because we do have a good partnership um, with their lab. So that's worth clarifying. Now, again, as I mentioned, if someone tends to be an overabsorber of cholesterol, we might do things like give them sterols or give them medications that block their absorption. Whereas if they're an overproducer, we might give them different types of statins depending on what's appropriate or maybe even something like red yeast rice from the natural therapeutics world because that product and the specific uh, component of it called monocolon K is actually what's responsible for the, the cholesterol lowering effect. And funny enough, that, um, that yeast, that byproduct is actually um, very similar in structure to, to most statin medications. So it works very similarly. And again, 
It's only indicated if it's indicated. And just the same, so we're gonna be covering a lot of things really quickly, so hold on to your hats again. We will be uh, sending these slides out after. Just the same, it's important to understand that what people eat um, can either harm them or hurt them, and, and when it comes to heart health, that's especially true. Um, and we can really break this down into two categories. You see two boxes here, um, and historically, fats have been demonized, and we've understood, especially in the last decade, that fats shouldn't be demonized. But still, just the same, there are some fats that are more cardioprotective, more protective of our hearts, and there are some fats that are less protective of our hearts. And so when it comes to um, some of the more concerning fats, certainly across the board, trans fats, you may see that listed as hydrogenated fats on, on labels. Um, there's a reason why margarine has gone out of favor. We were always afraid of things like butter, and we replaced it with a lot of hydrogenated oil um, which increased our consumption of trans fatty acids. And trans fats pretty clearly and pretty directly increase our risk for heart disease um, almost as much as anything else, almost as much as cigarette smoke, almost as much as that lack of community, almost as much as poor diet um, across the board. Um, saturated fat, the story is a little bit more complicated. For a long time, we were so afraid of saturated fat. Um, you may find saturated fat in things like uh, red meat, um, in things like the skin of poultry, for example, there's more saturated fat there. Um, we've learned that the issue wasn't 100% about saturated fat and that we don't have to fear it completely. And for some people that actually might be beneficial based on their genetics and uh, the rest of their lifestyle. But in general, you don't want your saturated fat levels in your blood to be too high. And so that's what we're measuring here is actual saturated fat levels in the blood. If we're gonna take the opposite approach and look at, well, what types of uh, fats and oils are really protective the very first line on that second box, um, you see something called monounsaturated fats. So they're, the saturated fats, the ones that are um, solid at room temperature, based on their chemical structure, fall into one category. And there's another category of fats that are unsaturated fats. And without going too deep into this, um, unsaturated fats can either be monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. It depends on the bonds um, in that ester. And so um, we can actually measure in the blood how much monounsaturated fat, which most people know of um, in things like olive oil and avocado. Almonds have a pretty high uh, amount of monounsaturated fat. Canola oil does as well, but for other reasons, we don't necessarily recommend canola oil. But in general, if you're consuming a lot of olive oil, which in the Mediterranean diet, that's probably one of the best um, contributors to the health of the, to the heart health of the Mediterranean diet, uh, certainly the more you consume of that, the higher your levels of monounsaturated fat is. And so what's great is through a simple blood test, we can actually tell whether you're getting enough and make a very targeted suggestion for you to get more. Just the same on the polyunsaturated fat side, we have the omega-3 fats. And the most important omega-3 fats are EPA. Oh, sorry, I skipped that slide. The most important omega-3s are EPA and DHA. And... Um, EPA, mostly in our diet, for, for the majority of people, comes through cold water fish. Um, things like salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, tuna has a decent amount, but we certainly want to be careful with some of the bigger predatory fish uh, mercury levels. Um, and we can measure something called the omega-3 index, which is an overall measure of, um, of these healthy, cardioprotective omega-3 fats. We can also look at the very specific ones, EPA and DHA, and if we can take a very uh, basic perspective on this, EPA tends to be a little bit more anti-inflammatory, which is certainly very important um, for heart health, and DHA uh, tends to be also anti-inflammatory, but um, in some ways more important for things like the nervous system and brain health and heart health. Um, that combination, the omega-3 index, is probably one of the best indicators we have of both dietary patterns and the success of dietary patterns, and just the same, the, um, the likelihood that someone will have improved heart health as a result. Um, and that goes across the board. We know that the same thing exists um, in the Alzheimer's world. Getting enough EPA and DHA is important. We know that for different types of autoimmune diseases, if you have a deficiency in these anti-inflammatory omega-3 fats, um, your likelihood of, of developing some of these disorders is higher. Um, and so truly here we're talking about heart disease, but it's really important to take a step back and understand that based on our genetics, we may be developing heart disease. 
but um, another person may develop rheumatoid arthritis, another person may develop cancer, and it's important to make sure that our bodies are getting what they need to do the best given that the genetics they've been given. And these, these fats really are, are a central pivot around that. Again, the saturated fat and the trans fat sort of being on the negative side, but not always negative like we talked about. And then the healthier fats, the monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated being quite important. And so we're just gonna skip to the next slide. And so I do see some questions coming in um, and we will uh, take those at the end. Let me just make sure there's no technical difficulties for anyone. See some chats coming in, great. Getting good feedback, sounds like the, the audio quality is good. And so that makes me very happy. So I mentioned earlier and we showed you that person's panel and they had their general good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And the reason we say good cholesterol called HDL is good is that historically its role that protein's role is in taking these cholesterol particles, pulling them away from our arteries, away from our heart, and back towards our liver. And the liver has certain receptors um, for both good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and it eats it up and chews it up and spits it out in different ways. Um, and so the more cholesterol we have moving away from our heart, in general, if we oversimplify it, the better it is. And the more cholesterol we have going away from our liver towards our arteries and towards our heart, the more risk there is. That's a very simplistic um, model based on probabilities and, and our bodies are far more complex than that, which we'll talk about um, in just a moment. So good cholesterol, I'd say is a misnomer that um, can uh, in some ways give people a false sense of safety and in other ways um, can, can really miss some real risk. So I'm just gonna close that chat box. And so when it comes to good cholesterol, again, we mentioned earlier, it's not the total volume of cholesterol that we care about. What we really care about is the types of little cars or shunts or proteins that are carrying the cholesterol from our liver to our heart and throughout our body. And this one that you see on the screen here called apolipoprotein A1, all you have to remember is that big letter A because um, when it comes to bad cholesterol, there's a big letter B that you're gonna see coming up uh, multiple times. And in general, the more um, of this APO A1, the healthier we are going to be. The reason that that is true is because we have more of this type of little shunt or car or protein, we'll just keep calling it the car, I guess, as we move forward. The more of this that we have, the more truly protective good cholesterol we have, the more truly protective um, um, HDL that we have. And the research shows that for every one milligram increase um, in this particle, um, there's a 26% decrease in cardiovascular disease. Every one milligram per deciliter, so we're looking here, the higher the better, 160 is considered optimal. Every one milligram per deciliter increase causes a 26% decrease in heart disease. That is a huge statistic and certainly something that we wanna target and certainly, importantly, something that we want to track as people make changes. You know, we have patients come in and they'll say, I made all these lifestyle changes and um, I'm taking this medication, I've lost 30 pounds, but I don't know if I've really reduced my risk. This is a way we can quantify that for them. Just the same, the reason that big letter A is important is because we want our HDL, our good cholesterol, to be as big and fluffy as possible. And so the more proteins or cars that are associated with that big fluffy cholesterol, the better it is. And so the one that's really important is this alpha one right here, the one at the very top. And there are different ranges for men and women that are protective. And you see, of course, same red, yellow, and green will be going on throughout. The more green we have in general, um, the more we're in the green or in an optimal range, generally the healthier we'll be. And the reality is um, for decades, we were looking at HDL cholesterol, but without knowing the breakdown into these five different particle types, we never had the full picture. And so I really urge you all to talk to your doctors um, and to understand the full picture um, as you're getting your information. And the great thing is um, lifestyle change and medication. So statins certainly increase both HDL cholesterol um, they increase these A1 particles, which are important. But interestingly, only a natural product, niacin, increases um, this ApoA1 concentration. Now, niacin is worth talking about. It's not safe for everyone. Um, it can cause a flush 
really uncomfortable flushing sensation. It can um, increase some liver damage and, and liver enzymes can, can be at risk um, if you take too much niacin. And in a small subset of patients, maybe 10 or 30% of people, it can also increase diabetes risk. And so you don't wanna just start taking it um, on your own. Natural doesn't always mean safe. Um, and so you definitely wanna be working with a doctor, but it is interesting to note that there are medications and there are also lifestyle things that in this case work better than statins and fibrates, which are the main um, prescription uh, that people will see. Now, if we switch gears to the quote unquote bad cholesterol, ApoB, Apo with a capital B, um, is the shunt or the protein or the car that tends to follow the more dangerous types of LDL. So if we just, to if we just count up the, the total volume of bad cholesterol, that's not really telling us much. But if we know the number of dangerous particles that carry protein, that actually tells us whether we're at risk or not. And so this ApoB, um, and on some blood tests you may see, um, it'll say LDL particle number, in general, ApoB is about 90% of LDL particle numbers. Some labs will calculate this directly. Some labs will tell your ApoB. It's pretty much giving you the same answer. The reality is this is probably of all the tests that we're looking at, probably the best indicator, the most important indicator of heart disease risk. The higher your LDL particle number, the higher your ApoB, and sometimes specifically it'll say ApoB 100, the more likely you are to have the types of bad cholesterol that cause you to be at risk. And the story gets a little bit more complicated because it's not just the, the protein or the car or the shunt that carries it, that ApoB being important, but it's also the size and the density of the actual cholesterol particle. And the size and the density in general, the more small and dense it is, the more risky, um, the more risky that is for the person. And so, um, in general, you want the percentage of total LDL cholesterol um, to be as low as possible in the small dense category. And so those two um, are really important and they actually follow each other. If your LDL particle number is, important, is normal or that ApoB that we just talked about on the previous screen is normal, you might not have to worry about the amount of small dense cholesterol because your total risk is lower. However, if your LDL particle number or your ApoB is high, then we really have to look at the percent small dense LDL um, to understand what the level of risk actually is. And finally, there's another marker that, as you see here, it says levels are genetically controlled. There's another marker that um, does contribute a decent amount. It's uh, sort of like the sidecar attached to those LDL particles, and it does confer a decent amount of risk. Um, but interestingly enough, um, because it's genetically controlled, there's not too much you can do, and medications don't reduce it too much, what we do know is that lifestyle changes can reduce this a little bit. I've seen this number come down considerably, um, and there are some medications that were, or natural therapeutics that we'll be talking about in a moment um, that will be helpful as well. So we're gonna switch gears. We've spent uh, a lot of time talking now about cholesterol particles and the, type that actually, the types that actually confer risk. Um, but Dr. Bongiorno mentioned in the beginning of this talk this idea that there are certain particles um, there are certain factors that, quote unquote, he used the word, poke holes in the arteries. And so inflammation, the amount of inflammation um, that's going on inside our arteries is what predisposes us for a lot of our, a lot of people with a lot of very specific genetics for having um, the types of damage that actually cause us to have elevated cholesterol. So very often for many people, high cholesterol follows um, an, an increase in, in inflammation. And just like the cholesterol, we can actually measure that and understand your risk. And so there are a couple of markers. There's actually four that are quite important for, um, for inflammation. Fibrinogen, and I'm gonna run through these fairly quickly. Like I said, for people, I, see, I do see some people are joining a little bit later. All these slides will be emailed to all participants, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. Um, but fibrinogen is a measure of essentially the stickiness of our, um, of our platelets. And so the likelihood of causing plaque is higher if our, if our platelets are much more sticky. And you see on the bottom here, for every 100 milligram per deciliter increase in fibrinogen, especially everything above 370, there's almost a two-fold increase in heart disease risk. And that makes sense. That this is a marker of inflammation. And inflammation is alerting us to damage going on. And if we're more likely to have plaques form because of that 
quote unquote stickiness, um, that'll create a problem down the line. There's another marker that we've known about in medicine for a long time called C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein goes up when anytime you have a cold, goes up when you have a, an infection. C-reactive protein even goes up if you exercise too much and your body is just put through a lot of stress. And in general, the more C-reactive protein, the CRP um, that we have, the more inflammation we have throughout our body. There's a more recently developed test called high sensitivity or HSCRP, and some, lab, some labs will call it cardio CRP that um, is a little bit more specific and able to calculate smaller amounts of C-reactive protein to tell us um, the amount that's likely to be in our, in our cardiovascular system and our arteries. And that's really where we care about inflammation the most, certainly in things like autoimmune disease and the rheumatoid arthritis I mentioned earlier, that's important, but um, high sensitivity CRP um, is something important and worth considering. Lipoprotein associated phospholipase A2, that's a mouthful, you don't have to worry about all of that. What you really have to take away here is LP, PLA2 levels will tell us how soft that plaque that's formed is likely to be. In general, what happens is that it's not that you get a gradual buildup of plaque, and I'll actually go back to the slide, the inflammation slide, and it looks here like as a person's healthier, they have wider arteries, and as they get more and more sick as far as their heart health, um, plaque builds up and it occludes it. That does happen, but our bodies are very resilient to, the, to those types of changes and they actually are able to form uh, blood vessels or vasculature to go around those areas to make sure that the heart muscle is still getting enough oxygen and enough nutrients. The more dangerous um, occurrence is when the plaque suddenly ruptures and a soft plaque that the, our immune systems are working on and breaking down um, is much more likely to rupture. So LPPLA2, in conjunction with some of those other measures, can predict uh, almost a two times higher risk of heart disease and stroke, which has some of the same or similar mechanisms. And interestingly enough, if that person has an elevated LPPLA2 and an elevated C-reactive protein, which is just this measure of overall inflammation, they're um, 11 times more likely to have um, a dangerous plaque that will rupture. And finally, in this same category is something called myeloperoxidase. It's a similar mechanism to this, the previous LPPLA2, but what's really important and really interesting um, to note is that um, among all measures, um, this measure is probably the best to predict the next six months of your life, the likelihood that you're gonna have a serious cardiovascular event in the next six months. So measuring this MPO tells us um, the level of urgency that we really have. If there's really um, restructuring of the plaques and if there's immune system activation and those white blood cells are acting on those plaques, um, we really wanna get that number down. And so that's where we decide in personalized and precise mes medicine um, to be a little bit more aggressive potentially with that patient in conjunction with the, you know, the work that they're doing with their cardiologist and, and all the other um, providers on their healthcare team. And I mentioned there are four important measures of inflammation. Homocysteine is a marker that builds up um, for a couple of reasons in our bodies. It can happen for genetic reasons. It can also happen because of a deficiency in certain B vitamins, specifically B9 or folate, B12 or B6. Um, but basically what happens is if you have too much homocysteine running around your bloodstream, that is also an inflammatory factor that can increase all the risks for those other things. And you see the list, um, the list of risks that high homocysteine can cause, um, heart disease, it can cause uh, sudden thrombosis of the veins, stroke, it also really correlates a lot to Alzheimer's risk. It's probably one of the best indicators we have of future Alzheimer's risk. And I would actually say that um, this optimal range of under 10, I like to see that number under seven or eight if we're, if we're really trying to be aggressive and proactive, that homocysteine is another important marker um, that doctors are just starting to catch up with um, in terms of measuring. Now, if inflammation is one of the factors that sort of pulls the trigger on those genetics and pokes the holes in those arteries, elevated blood sugar and insulin resistance is another. And so we're going to talk about a couple of measures. It is, you know, this isn't a talk about diabetes or metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, but it is a factor in heart disease. And certainly, if a person has insulin resistance or if a person has um, elevated blood sugar in general, 
they're much more likely to have high cholesterol for some of the reasons that Dr. Bongiorno mentioned earlier. And so we have, to, we have to understand globally and comprehensively what that person's risk is. And so when it comes to um, looking at blood sugar, there's the actual sugar that we can measure, but there's also hormones in our body. And this one is specifically something called a cytokine that's actually produced by our fat cells. And you would think that we want less fat cells and we want them to produce less of whatever they produce, but it's actually quite the opposite. The more of this fact, the more of this function um, that we have, the better we are. The, the general, uh, in general, the less likely we are to be inflamed, the easier it is for us to lose weight, the more physically resilient and robust we feel. This adiponectin marker, um, the higher the better, um, and weight loss can help, um, but paradoxically, it's actually produced by our fat cells. And so getting this number up through lifestyle change is one of the best things that you can do to reduce your likelihood of diabetes and insulin resistance. Just the same, we want to get a, a full and complete picture of, um, of diabetes risk and insulin resistance risk. And hemoglobin A1C is something that you're more likely to see than some of these other tests that we've talked about. Hemoglobin A1C um, is on average a three month uh, marker of what, the, what your blood sugar has been over the last three months. And in general, with pretty good confidence, we can say if that number gets too high, that person's on their way towards diabetes. And so we can even call someone in, in the pre-diabetic range if they're in this borderline, um, just under 6.4, or if they're above 6.4, they're now entering diabetes 6.7. That's certainly, um, it's certainly on the way. And we see patients here all the time uh, with A1Cs of 11, 12, 13, truly uncontrolled diabetes, even if they are on medications. Um, again, this isn't a talk about diabetes, but lifestyle really can go a long way to my mind, diabetes is a truly prever preventable, and at times, if you get it at the right time, reversible chronic disease. And so um, hemoglobin A1C is, is a, an important foundational marker to understand someone's risk. Just the same, we want to understand, well, if a person's blood sugar, if you get a, a blood sugar test, sort of a fasting test in the morning on, on what's called a comprehensive metabolic panel, um, we understand in that snapshot in time, maybe your blood sugar was 70 or 80 or 90 or certainly over 126 if you have diabetes, or if you have an elevated A1C, that's one piece of the puzzle. But we also have to understand um, how hard is your body working to get that blood sugar to that level. And so our pancreas, um, right in the middle of our abdomen, um, our pancreas is an important organ. It's an important gland that produces, among other things, something called insulin. And insulin is basically the key that opens the door or opens the window into the cells of our body to allow blood sugar to come in. And if our insulin levels are too high, in, in relation to the amount of glucose we have, it's possible that we're experiencing something called insulin resistance. And as much as possible, we need to be able to predict that months or years in advance so that we can reverse the cause because insulin resistance contributes to higher cholesterol and it contributes to heart disease, um, much like the inflammation that we just spoke about. So getting the insulin level down is really important. Measuring insulin really completes the picture to understand what this person's actual risk is compared to others. So we've been talking a lot about what we can measure through the blood, and now we're going to spend a little bit of time understanding individualized risk and understanding the genetics um, that uh, someone has that might contribute to their likelihood of developing all these types of diseases. APOE is probably the most important one. Um, APOE has been popularized and, and it's made sort of infamous um, in the Alzheimer's world. Certainly, if people have two copies of this um, E4 variety of this gene, they're more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. Um, if they have one, they're much more likely if they have two copies. If they have one copy, they're still more like they're still more likely than the average population. And if they have this E2 variety, again, there are, there are three types, the E2, E3, and E4. If they have the E2 variety, they're actually protected from Alzheimer's disease. And if they have the E3 variety, they're somewhere in the middle. And so we know if we get two copies, one from mom and one from dad of E3, we probably have average risk of Alzheimer's. But what's interesting, and, and the research really in the last decade is showing us that Alzheimer's isn't just this random brain disease, it's a systemic disease with a susceptibility of the brain. Um, what's interesting is much the same research that we've learned in Alzheimer's is actually correlating to cholesterol levels and to likelihood of diabetes and vice versa, likelihood of diabetes and high cholesterol and LDL 
And that ApoB that we talked about actually increases your risk for brain disease. So we're talking about brain health because ApoE, um, that's the, the forum within which that's usually spoken about, um, but it's, it's important for cardiovascular health. And the reason is that your ApoE that you got from mom and dad actually determines um, how, how well you absorb certain different types of cholesterol and, and specifically the very low density cholesterol and what's called chylomicrons. Without going into all the, the biochemistry and the physiology, chylomicrons are uh, formed by our bodies when we absorb fats um, through our food. And so what we know is that people with the ApoE4 variety, though their risk is higher, interestingly enough, they're also much more likely to be responsive to some of our therapies. And so we often get this question, well, is it worth knowing the genetics if there's nothing I can do? I would say yes, because if someone has um, these yellow or red varieties, if they have one or two copies of this E4, yes, they have a higher risk of high cholesterol and heart disease and brain disease, but it also tells us that we need to be much more aggressive with that person, whereas someone with an E2 or E3 might not benefit as much, and actually there might be more harm um, than benefit in those cases. Similarly, on a genetic level, um, clopidogrel is a medication that's often given for people with heart disease risk. Um, the other name for it is Plavix. And our ability to metabolize Plavix, Plavix is a blood thinner, um, is very much genetically controlled, again, based on what we got from mom and dad. And the story here is a little more complicated than even the ApoE in the sense that a person with certain genetic predispositions can have, can be an increased metabolizer of Plavix. An increased metabolizer means that they're actually making it more, they're, they're making the medication, they're processing it more quickly and they're making it more effective. Um, because what we have to do when we, um, when we take this medication is actually convert it from its drug form to a form that can actually be used in our body. So increased metabolizers um, are better at making that more effective. Decreased metabolizers need a different dose of the medication. So we can use this, um, this test to help us understand whether someone needs the standard dose, normal metabolizers in this case would use the standard dose, whether they need a slightly changed dose based on some of these genetics, or they need a markedly changed dose based on um, how quickly they metabolize the drug through their liver. And so based on something called CYP, which is an enzyme system that, that works in our liver, we can understand and give someone a targeted dose of a medication if they've gotten to the point that a blood thinner truly is uh, what they need. We mentioned earlier this idea of fibrinogen, the stickiness, the likelihood of, of um, our platelets and our cells clotting, and that contributing to our likelihood of having a plaque that can downstream cause something like a heart attack. Well, there's also a lot of genetics involved in whether we are likely to have those kinds of plaques. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because we're running on the end of our time. Um, prothrombin 2, and then this next one, factor 5 laden. These are tests that you only have to do once in your life. They don't change. It's not like the cholesterol test that you can track. They tell you your likelihood of forming clots. And so people with a factor 5 laden mutation that increases their likelihood of forming clots, people with a prothrombin factor 2 mutation, if their doctor ordered it, ordered it for the rest of their life, they now know that they have to be much more vigilant. And how can you be more vigilant? Well, it could be simple things like getting enough water. Everyone should get enough water. But if you're more likely to cause... Um, to, to have clots form in your body that can be quite dangerous, um, certainly you need to be more vigilant about that. These are people who would do well with a baby aspirin. The research is where we're trying to understand and really break people into the groups to understand who does better with what medications. This is one way to figure that out. Just the same if you're on a cross-country flight, the likelihood of that aviation of having a clot form is higher if you have one of these two mutations. So that's certainly... Um, an important factor. And finally, we started with this idea that um, a comprehensive approach that involves lifestyle and maybe some medications and an understanding of risk and genetics um, is a useful approach. And it's a better approach than maybe just giving everyone in the country a statin blindly based on one number that doesn't really confer a lot of risk. The reality is statins are not without side effects. And people with this genetic mutation, this SLC01B1, have a 17 times higher risk of having what's called statin-induced myopathy, so muscle damage that happens because of the statin. 
just the same, those same people who are at higher risk are also less likely to benefit from statin medication than others. And so for those people, there are different types of statins that are sort of more uh, water soluble statin medications that might be more appropriate. So not only can you be more specific with the type of medication, you might also decide that that medication is the risk benefit, um, that, that ratio is just not worth it and, and the risks outweigh the benefits. And this is based on, again, one mutation. Um, if you got a cytosine, if you remember back to biology class from mom and from dad, it turned into one amino acid change, one tiny change can impact your ability to have these medications. So truly the medicine that we recommend of the future, truly precision medicine, we'll look at all this stuff. We'll have everyone's genetic information. We'll look at an expanded um, blood test panel and we'll be able to really, really recommend and prescribe really personalized medicines. Similarly, um, heart disease and kidney disease really um, relate pretty, pretty strongly to each other. And, and this is a test that's not often done but to my mind is a better and an earlier indicator of kidney disease um, than the typical, what you would see is something called BUN, blood urea nitrogen or creatinine. Cystatin C tells us that there's damage going onto the kidneys earlier in the, in the process. And why do I bring this up? Well, without appropriate kidney function, there's, uh, there's something called cardiorenal syndrome um, as the most extreme example. Without appropriate kidney function, our heart just can't do what it needs to do. We can't metabolize and detoxify things um, appropriately. And so I mentioned earlier um, in our last couple of minutes, and we will take some questions, that our goal here was to talk much, much, much more about how do you understand your risk and putting it into the context of your overall lifestyle choices than it was to make specific recommendations. I mean, as, as naturopathic doctors in this integrative and functional medicine world, we deal a lot with people coming in with 20 different supplements that they got from Dr. Google or you know, saw in Dr. Oz or, or um, maybe a friend told them at the health food store. The reality is natural doesn't always mean safe. I mentioned that earlier with the niacin, um, but, but also that all these supplements and all these uh, new, what are called nutraceuticals these days are not effective without all those lifestyle choices. So making sure you get enough sleep, Dr. Bongiorno mentioned that, not smoking cigarettes, eating a, a heart health promoting diet that's anti-inflammatory is really important. Uh, making sure that you're handling your stress and your resilience to stress is important. Access to a loving community is important. The ability to express yourself um, freely through things like journaling is, is a useful tool. And at the very end of that, we might look at supplements, vitamins, minerals, certain herbs. And so I did put a list on here. And again, you will get these slides of, of different nutraceuticals that might be effective either alongside of a pharmaceutical medication or instead of when it's safe and appropriate and, and agreed upon uh, by the entire clinical team. Um, but it's also really important to understand that uh, there's no one right fix for everyone. And so some people truly need to reduce their lipids. Some people just need to get their inflammation down and maybe their cholesterol numbers will improve um, directly. Others still need to reduce their likelihood of insulin resistance and blood sugar issues. And then um, the, the lipid changes um, happen or the cholesterol changes happen, um, they follow suit. And interestingly, I, you know, I did try to put these into nice little boxes because we are all categorical thinkers, but the reality is that um, many of these substances, I'll highlight berberine as one of them, actually fall into all three categories. And the research is showing us that they work because they directly impact cholesterol levels, most often by impacting what's called the LDL receptor. So our, our liver's ability to, um, to catch all those little cars coming by with the bad cholesterol and to eat them up and process them. Um, but they also affect our likelihood of, of being inflamed. They impact the amount of our cholesterol particles that are oxidized, which are much more likely to cause damage. And just the same, they very often reduce blood sugar. So berberine, it's, an, it's what's called an alkaloid. It's found in many plants. Um, used appropriately, it's got some similar functions um, to another medication that's actually prescribed called metformin. And metformin is often prescribed for diabetics to reduce their blood sugar. It's often prescribed for people with high cholesterol as well. Um, used appropriately in the right person, like I mentioned earlier, at the right time, berberine, as part of a comprehensive treatment approach, 
might be a useful tool because it does all three of these things. It lowers your cholesterol directly, it reduces inflammation, and it, it helps to reduce your blood sugar. And so I really recommend everyone on this call, um, go see a naturopathic doctor. Um, it's really important to hopefully now that you've got a little bit of a clearer picture as to what, what types of factors you can measure that confer risk, it's really important to understand um, that, as I mentioned earlier, you should feel empowered to take charge of your health. You should feel comfortable going to your doctor and asking them to measure these things, especially if you have a family history of heart disease. That's something we haven't even mentioned. There's all types of risk calculators um, based on age and based on gender and based on family history. Um, there's also more invasive diagnostic tests that can actually look at the arteries in your heart, look at the arteries um, in your neck to see uh, what kind of risk you have. And so, uh, you know, we haven't even gotten into all that because that you should really talk about with your doctor. But you should feel comfortable going into your doctor's office and saying, you know, I, I just heard a webinar. Here's a list of tests that I, I understand the research shows helps me understand whether I'm at risk or not. And then once you're equipped with that information, let's get some lifestyle changes on board. Um, let's reduce your blood sugar. Let's keep inflammation at bay. Let's directly lower insulin when that's appropriate. Um, and so without going into many more specifics, because we are um, even a couple minutes over time, um, I appreciate everyone staying on who's able to. Um, we'll go from there. And if anyone has very specific questions after, what I will do is send a link um, so you can schedule a free 10 or 15 minute uh, free consult to speak more specifically about your concerns, your history, et cetera. So um, that'll be available to you. We'll, we'll send an email after this talk. Some of those same factors we mentioned that actually contribute to heart disease, not smoking, not sleeping well, not getting REM sleep or deep wave, slow wave sleep that's restorative. All these factors really contribute. Um, diet, of course, will always be an important one. And so now let me see if we have any questions that have come in during this time. So we got one question uh, and the question was whether it would be best to run total or free insulin. Um, I typically run total insulin and that gives me a sufficient um, understanding. There's something called the HOMA IR index, the HOMA IR index. Um, and that's based on uh, essentially a calculation of of your glucose at the moment and your insulin at the moment, and that uses total insulin. So to my mind, uh, total insulin, insulin is a little bit of a better indicator of, of actual risk. But that's a great question. Um, so if you have any other questions, um, keep them coming. So we've got one here. Um, how often is it worth getting these tests done I think establishing a baseline is really important. Um, again, it depends on your family risk. If you have really high risk of heart disease and, and you and your cardiologist or your naturopathic doctor are really worried about this, um, getting these tested once a year might be a good idea. The caveat to that is if, you're, if we're making changes um, to either your medications or your lifestyle or your nutrient protocol, um, some of my patients will do it every three months, sometimes every six until we figure out exactly what the appropriate protocol and the regimen is that they should be on. So I'd say um, baseline, if you're not making major changes, um, you know, get a baseline and then maybe every two or three years you should measure these. Definitely get the total cholesterol because you can follow it over time. And if you knew what your risk was before, um, it's not that that test is useless, it's just not enough by itself. And so you can use, um, you can do smaller versions of each test as you move forward. Um, and then if you are treating, then you want to do so every, uh, every couple of uh, months, probably until you figure out what the best case is. So we've got one other question here and then we'll probably wrap up. And that's actually, this is a, a great question. So question came in is if we can talk about very briefly a case, um, of someone who had elevated risk, um, for whom we may have not known that risk. I did have a patient actually that I saw a couple of weeks ago that comes to mind who for years was told that her risk of um, heart disease was quite low because all her cholesterol levels were low. Um, but there was something nagging at her because there was some family history of high cholesterol and hypertension. 
um, which doesn't always fit into the, the typical risk calculators, but she came in and we wanted to get a more comprehensive assessment. Um, so we ran one of these Boston heart tests. Um, and what came back was that though your t her total cholesterol was normal and her lipids were normal, her ApoB was through the roof. It was, you know, in those red categories. Um, she also had an elevated homocysteine and a, a gene called MTHFR, which we haven't really spoken about. And there was some increased risk of clot. And so this, to my mind, was a person who, not even knowing their lifestyle, is someone who has increased risk for inflammation, has an increased risk of clot formation, which is what causes those dangerous heart attack type risk factors, and at the same time has the most important indicator, which was that ApoB or particle number. And so, oh, and then she also had a high small dense cholesterol. So a couple of points there that we were concerned about. Um, we did put her on a regimen. She wanted to try six months of lifestyle with, with the approval of her cardiologist before going on any kind of medication. Um, once she came back to the cardiologist and showed them these tests, they were very clear and, and agreeing that it was time to start treatment. Um, but she did convince them that lifestyle was something she wanted to try. Um, this woman lost over the course of four months 25 pounds. Um, we, we basically just cut out, and, and it, of course, you have to personalize diet for everyone. We cut out um, anything with added sugar, any processed foods, and we cut out all grains. Um, and within three months, she had lost 25 or 30 pounds. Um, her diet was not great before and, and definitely a little bit of a sugar addict. Um, just the same, we put her on a nutraceutical regimen. Some of the ones mentioned there, um, we put her on a little bit of berberine. We put her on some soluble fiber because there was some con concern around blood sugar spiking. And we actually did put her on niacin and tract and made sure her liver enzymes were normal throughout. Um, and those numbers came back. We did two tests. Um, the, the last one was a few weeks ago. We saw the results. Um, she moved truly from that red category on those lipid markers to the yellow and then three months later into the green. And so she was thrilled. She went back to her cardiologist. They basically told her, um, a, your likelihood of, of becoming a diabetic is just plummeted. And B, I don't need to put you on a statin medication anymore because your cholesterol numbers are all beautiful. Um, so that was, that was certainly a win um, from that perspective. Um, we did get one more question whether we run the Boston Heart um, test in the office. We do. Um, so uh, feel free to give Lindsay a call and she could talk to you about logistics. Um, our office number you can see on the screen here, 631-421-1848. And keep an eye out for that um, link in the email with the slides um, because you'll have an opportunity there to schedule a, um, a, a consult just to go over your specific concerns and to see if this is the right approach for you um, based on what your actual body needs. Um, so I'm just going to put it out again. Any last second questions? Otherwise, we will be wrapping up. Okay, um, and also feel free to email me. Um, my email is drkochko at innersourcehealth.com. You can also email this info at innersourcehealth.com that you see on the screen and that'll go to, go to our office um, and it'll find its way to me. You can also email Dr. Bongiorno if you have any questions about anything that he said. Um, but on behalf of Dr. Bongiorno and myself, thank you all for joining. I know it's late. I know we went a little bit over, um, but it, it felt important. Um, and, it, and it felt necessary. So I appreciate you all sticking through to the end. Um, keep an eye out and, and we'll be happy to answer any questions and continue the dialogue as we move forward. Thank you and have a great evening.